one of the uh, questions that everybody asks is the whole failing fast uh, schema. That when you're looking at major programs, the failing fast concept might not be as good of an idea ultimately. And that some of these programs got into trouble because of the military services and their behavior, not because of the oversight they were getting from OSD. From your standpoint, what are the right ways to make sure that the services don't start to do things that we end up paying a big price for five, ten years down the line in, in the drive to try to do the right thing, but ultimately maybe end up doing the wrong thing? We want to fail fast on the R&E side of the world. So the idea is we do a lot more um, prototyping and experimenting before we actually get to milestone A. So that when we enter into an actual acquisition program, we have a better understanding of technical capability and cost. So that's why you'll see that Dr. Griffin and r and &E is standing up 10 different offices with individuals focusing on each of the 10 technology domains called out um, in the National Defense Strategy. So so we don't want to fail fast in the middle of a major acquisition program or any acquisition program. We want to fail fast during the prototyping phase. Brief follow-up from a requirement standpoint. How do you make sure that the services are doing the right thing and not executing a program that may be somewhat less well thought out than everybody in retrospect would like, whether it's LCS uh, or ground combat system or, or you know programs like that that the services themselves may not have as well thought through as they should have? What we have is some legislation, I believe it's Section 807, that requires before getting into an MDAP that is going to be delegated to the services that we look at cost, schedule, and capability, and that's signed off at the depsec def level. In reality, that means that CAPE and ANS and R&E are spending a lot of time. So you will see ANS looking at the overall program, the programmatics, the risk in it. You'll see CAPE looking at the cost estimates, and you'll have R&E developing ITRAs to say what the technical risk is. So that's the gate getting into programs. Go ahead. Yep, you did. Oh, thanks. Uh, Pat Tucker from Defense One. You mentioned in your talk fast track uh, sales authorities, getting fed to Saudi Arabia and things like this. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, next steps for that. You said that it would potentially shave years off of uh, that transfer. Uh, and how do you know how hard was it to get to this point and what happens next? So the idea here is that we often have the same system that is being sold to multiple countries or perhaps a small variant of that. If we've just gone through all the certified cost and pricing and gone through all the DCMA, DCA work um, there, and we have current information, we can take that and leverage that to quickly go and sell to another country. Um, so that's the basic idea. Um, and then we'll always follow up and verify and so forth. Uh, the idea is that we sat down with the services, we talked about the authorities, they nominated programs, and we have the ANS subject matter experts um, working with the services, and we're moving forward to execute them, and we follow up um, from the DSCA, from the service, from an AS, ANS point of view, regularly to track that process. One of the things when you talk about foreign military sales that's a little bit different than we're doing now is I've convened a monthly meeting basically using the construct we use for our warfighter sen senior integration groups where um, I chair the meeting and we've got all of the services there. We have policy, um, we have state representation, and we talk about what we have for FMS um, LORs and LOAs and prioritize them by region. And we work with everyone in the room to highlight any issues so that we can simultaneously quickly work through um, the issues. And these streamlined methodologies are being discussed in that forum as well. Just a quick follow-up, are there any other countries that you're seeing an interest or a demand signal from? for fast-tracked authority, Ukraine, for instance, or anything like that? Everybody wants things faster, sooner, better. Yeah, that's going to follow up on that, because there's with uh, somebody from Ukraine yesterday who was out here shopping 
through some things. I was wondering what efforts there might be to sort of get out some of the ITAR concerns that, that they have. And some of the, uh, we actually have quite a focus on the Ukraine, and I've been talking with policy just over the last week about trying to find an individual who can work directly with the Ukraine to help them with their acquisition process um, on an intermittent basis, and we're going to do that. So I think the fact that ANS is working very, very closely with State Department is making a difference. I meet routinely with Tina Caden now, mm -hmm. and we talk about issues. I think the fact that um, General Hooper's deputy at DSCA is Greg Kalsner, whose background is State Department, all helps. Um, so I, from where I sit, I think the interagency process is working better than it ever has, and there's a very, very high level of communication. I think you had a question. Yes, yes. Uh, Jen Johnson with Defense News. Um, you had mentioned that you're putting together you know, an entire AT and L reorganization, uh, sort of do what the new organization is due out June first. Um, that's that's right around the corner, so I'm hoping that maybe you can um, tease out some of the things that um, you're pretty sure will be a part of the new organization. That Absolutely. Um, some of the things I said is that we've gone from four ASDs to three ASDs. We've done away with a number of DASDs. We have basically looked at what the work is that was being done, which over the years has gone to different um, offices for different reasons. We also have a lot of congressional um, requirements for different offices and so forth. And what we've done is looked at the body of work we have to do and figured out what the most efficient and effective way is to organize that group. One of the things that I am implementing that we haven't done as much in the past is putting in an HR professional. In the Pentagon, typically you have personnel people who help you do transactions, but in OSD you haven't had what I'd call strategic HR. And human capital is what differentiates us from everyone else. So until we have, until we can attract, develop, and retain the right skill sets and the right attitudes, we can't make this wholesale change. So bringing in um, an HR professional to work closely with me, as well as working with DAU in a different way, we're much, much more actively involved with DAU. And every day I'm asking people to give Jim Woolsey a call and talk about what we're doing. Um, those are two very, very significant differences. but. What you'll see is a more streamlined organization. I believe that communications are really the key to everything. So you will see a very highly interactive group that is not as stovepiped as once perhaps they were. For instance, we still have DCMA um, reporting administratively through ASDA. We still have DITRA. Um, reporting administratively through NCB, New Chembio. However, the individuals who run those organizations report operationally to me, come to my staff meetings, because what they're doing is so important. They are right between us and the warfighter, and I want to make sure that their voice is heard and that we staff out any issues they have, and that if the directors of those organizations aren't successful moving forward on their objectives that I know about it quickly so I can help support them. Thank you. We'll just keep going around. Okay. Uh, thanks. Ashley Rokey with Shepard. Mm -hmm. um, you had talked quite a bit about FMF sales and mm -hmm. how that sort of gets at the national defense strategies, mm -hmm. um, working with allies. Could you talk a bit more about what is actually going on with um, the acquisition and the weapon systems? We have a larger relook at them. Um, are they adequate for the conventional wars? Um, what needs to be changed? Yeah. Um, in terms of what we're exporting? No, just in terms of what we're developing and the capabilities. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the main reason that r and &E was stood up was because although we believe we still have technical overmatch, we believe that has been diminishing over the past few years because we have not embraced um, new technologies 
at the pace with which we need to in order to develop applications and field systems. So while we have all the programs of record we have with some very cutting edge things, we believe that we need a whole new level of capability. So you will see an energized focus on hypersonics, for instance, um, a lot of programs looking at that. You um, will see an enormous amount of effort on artificial intelligence and utilizing that. Um, you will see hardened electronics being looked at, um, command and communications to make sure that we are truly interoperable amongst all the domains. Um, a lot of cybersecurity focus as well. So what we're doing, I think, writ large, is looking at interoperable multi-domain solutions, a lot more focus on space, um, and really all of the services working together in a joint battle. Just a quick follow-up on that. I, I know the Army is, you know, relooking their portfolio too as they look towards mm -hmm. modernization, mm -hmm. and then Dr. Griffin is leading some of these things on hypersonics. Mm -hmm. um, is there an overarching program to look at that or a mandate coming down from to the To Supreme look at what? To look at their portfolio of weapons. Um, as they the armies? The, well, the Army is doing it, but to the other services. Well, well, that gets, yes, okay. That gets back to what I was talking about in terms of portfolio management okay. as we move um, in ASDA from really oversight, although there's still oversight and there are these checks and balances. What we're really trying to do is understand mission capability working very, very closely with R&E. So R&E is looking at actual technical mission capability ANS is looking across the spectrum of warfare and seeing if we have all of the war fighting gaps addressed that we might have today. Um, so we are taking horizontal cuts for, and we have councils within the Pentagon that look at that. So I co-chair several councils with General Selva um, from Joint Staff. And what we're essentially doing is for electronic warfare, for instance, looking across the electromagnetic spectrum and make sure, making sure we are dealing offensively and defensively with every portion of that. Hi. Uh, very quickly, are there any aspects of the existing Pentagon bureaucracy that you've come in from industry that have surprised you by how well they work? Is there anything worth keeping? Inherently I think that there's a lot that's worth um, keeping. I mean, the Pentagon is the largest organization in the world dealing with very, very complex problems. And we are doing that, as I said earlier, jointly with our allies and partners. So the degrees of freedom here are enormous. Um, I think what is working very well um, is how Secretary Mattis has clearly laid out his objectives. So this provides a framework for all of us to then develop our objectives. I believe that the entire team communicates very effectively. Um, and what we've been able to do is leverage all the different teams to come up with pretty crisp articulations of um, what we have for capability. So for instance, the service secretaries and the chiefs are now monthly briefing Secretary Mattis on readiness and modernization. So where they are with key programs, key capability, where they are in personnel readiness, where they are in equipment readiness. Um, one of the things we have found is that different groups have different standards and measures for reporting these things. And we've been able to leverage the entire team to come together and use some same standards. So for instance, um, just this week, we are finalizing a look at precision guided munitions that incorporates all these individual bureaucracies at their best into one, where my team um, now has um, information 
that looks at the demand signal for precision guided munitions from the joint staff, layers on top of that what we need for training, layers on top of that what we need for foreign military sales, and then looks at each of the critical munitions to understand where we are in terms of inventory versus the demand signal, which is going to in turn allow us to go back to our industry partners and give them not the Army view, the Air Force view, the Marine Corps view, the FMS view, but a full look, again, trying to project out a little clearer demand signal that will allow them to do planning, whether that be material buys, whether that be equipment purchases, whether that be facility purchases, that type of thing. So that's where I think we can leverage individual bureaucracies um, for the betterment of the whole. And because there is a very clear chain of command, very clear roles and responsibilities, when you have a clear need a clear demand signal, you can very quickly turn a result. Any surprises coming in after 30 years from industry? And in All the time. All the time. Um, I think some small things and some large things. Um, maybe some large things I don't see at the component level the financial resources and the human resource um, resources that I would typically use. In industry, if you're running a large organization and you're the lead, you have your finance individual on one side and your HR individual on the other, and then your P&L leads. Mm -hmm. um, the Pentagon AT&L was not um, configured that way, so I've had to work to find um, to define those slots and get uh, people with the correct skill sets. So that's large because I think organizational structure matters, and then filling um, those billets, if you will, with the correct skill sets and people that not only have the skill sets but the correct attitudes to get the job done. On a smaller level, um, I was a bit surprised at how many meetings we go to that have an enormous number of people in them, um, because people can tend to invite themselves to meetings, if you will, which is great if you're participating and actively engaged and contributing. But what um, surprised me, and I've changed a little bit, is if I'm running a meeting, we're going to end up with actions out of that meeting with individuals' names on it and actual dates for those deliverables versus a vague group that's responsible, you know, at some future point in time. So I think. The day-to-day -day meeting discipline, which is what I'll call business discipline, which is short-term results, because I think lots of short-term results lead to long-term gains. And so I was a little bit surprised at the lack of what I'll call meeting discipline. Um, we actually edited a document in real time, projecting it on a screen a couple weeks ago, which was not a natural behavior. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, obviously, during your remarks, you emphasize um, exportability and said that we have to bake that into our programs. What does that exactly mean? I mean, what are our uh, you know allies looking for in general across all of these? Okay, programs? so a couple things. One, we want when we draft a contract to put CLINs in there that will allow you to very quickly put in um, detailed requirements and prices and times so that you contractually have a framework that's a fill in the blank. And then when you're talking about an architecture, what we need to do is understand right now what's exportable, what's not, and does have a modular ex, um, architecture where you can plug in and plug out certain radios, for instance, that will, aren't exportable, certain data links, um, so that we are cognizant of the features that are currently not exportable and that we designed the architecture so that those features can be easily pulled out or the instantiation we have of them today and the customer can put in their own. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you all.